Welcome to the AWS Architecture Series. This is a part two of quick certification notes, and we are going to discuss a picture of AWS infrastructure, where we are going to discuss about common on the building blocks of AWS Cloud. So let's begin. In this series today, we are going to discuss this slide, and we're going to talk about each component that you can see in this slide. I prepared this slide for an easy understanding about how and what each service means and where it sits in the overall infrastructure. So this is very much 101 of AWS Cloud. So you can see on the left side, we have a Route 53. Route 53 sends traffic to the Internet Gateway. Route 53 is talking to only one region in this case. The region is US East 1. It can talk to more than one region based on geolocation or latency-based routing, or you can have weighted routing. To keep it simple, I'm just keeping it to one region so that we can explain all the resources, all the boxes over here to define, just to define how these resources are bound to these boxes over here. The, the outermost box is defining a region. Then we have a VPC. This is the CIDR range that we have selected, 10.0.0.0/16. VPC has one and two AZs defined here. So you have availability zone one and availability zone two. VPC has one internet gateway and only one. There is another VPC level resource, which is uh, the application load balancer or the ELB. ALB is connected with AZ1 and AZ2 both. So that's why it is showing up here. Each VPC has one or more AZs. In our case, our AZ1 has one, two, and three private subnets, and public subnets total. And AZ2 has similar number of subnets, like you have one public and these two private. Let's talk about public subnets. Public subnet is having a NAT gateway. NAT gateway is required for any kind of private subnet interaction. That is, if the private subnet EC2 sitting in the private subnet needs to talk to internet or download something from the internet, it will talk to the NAT gateway. There cannot be an invocation of a connection from outside through a NAT gateway. It is only from inside. So once the invocation happens, it goes through the internet gateway, pulls out the information that is needed, and brings it down. So the requester is always from the inside, not from the outside. Let's talk about the other public subnet with a similar infrastructure. Each NAT gateway has an elastic IP attached if it needs to be public. If you create a NAT gateway, it is not public. If it doesn't talk to internet, then it is private in nature. But then there is no such usage of NAT gateway. You can do that. There are options to do it. Primary use of NAT gateway is to allow internet connectivity to the internal resources sitting in the private subnets. Now let's talk about NACL. In this case, we have these NACLs. Uh, this is NACL1 associated with both public subnets. Each subnet can have only one NACL. Let's move to the second box over here, this red box. You can see the Application load balancer is sitting under a similar kind of red box, and it is called external uh, SG. Now, external SG means it is having a security group that allows you to interact with IPs coming from the internet. While web security group, Usually, in most of the cases, we have seen that people tend to have their public servers or web servers sitting in the public subnet. But this is also possible that you can keep your web servers in the private subnet and still use a load balancer to, to allow an incoming connection or allow load balancer to be public that can talk to the web server sitting in the private space. So in this case, you have a web security group. It is allowing AT and 443 traffic from the external ESG or security group. If you look at the other construct that we have is you have one EC2 instance in each AZ in private subnet here and private subnet here. But you also have an auto scaling group, which is this. Now, auto scaling group can be part of more than one AZ. So you can see 
auto scaling group is associated with AZ1 and AZ2 both. And there is a arrow that is going outside to the NAT gateway from here and NAT gateway from here. So NAT gateways are a zonal or availability zone specific resource. So if you have more than one availability zone, you can you can still do the trafficking through the a single NAT gateway, but it is always good to have a similar kind of NAT gateway available. Otherwise, you'll have a cross AZ data charges and other complications that you can arise. It's better to have a NAT gateway specific to your AZ. Um, going on further, you can see the route table, this route table that is public, this route table that is public. You can follow this arrow and you can see what we are putting in this route table. Both these route tables that are associated with public subnet have an entry for Internet Gateway, which is this. If you talk about the other route tables, which is for our private subnets, private subnets uh, 10.0.1.0 and 10.0.4.0 slash 24 it has a route table both these route table this and this you can see that the route table in az2 has an entry for nat 02 which is this one at gateway 02 and then on the right side on the top side in az1 you can see a similar entry for nat 01 which is this one there's a route table. This is going from here to here. There's another private subnet. And what we have done here is anything that is web related is under web security group. Anything under database is under a data security group. And we are just saying allow 3306 from web security group. Only this security group allows is allowed to talk to this particular uh, data security group so any any resources under data security group will be open only for access to web security group right now in in the data security group you in one private subnet you have a master database and then you can have a replication to wait application in this case you can have a standby or you can have a master master depending upon if it is a Aurora, you can have that. Uh, multi-region or multi, multi AZ, you can have a replication. So in this case, it is master and standby. Now, this also has route tables. These route tables are having similar kind of uh, information. And this is required just because suppose I want to upgrade my database with the new patches or any kind of version upgrade, it still needs to go to the internet. It goes to the internet using the same NAT gateway. In this case, similarly here. You can also see that we, we have the EFS mount target, EFS here and EFS here. Now EFS mount target is just a kind of a, a connectivity to a file system. It's uh, so the EFS sits outside, and you have a mount target. Once the mount target is there, then it shows up like a network drive. EC2 instance having this EFS mount target, and then you can access it as a network drive. So you'll need to have EFS mount target. The purpose of this particular slide is to just explain what sits where, what kind of resources are bound to some boundaries in this case like what is a az level resource what is a subnet level thing and how the interactions are happening between them a few things to note over here is the NACL. Um, you can see uh, it is mentioned it is a stateless thing it doesn't maintain state so if you define inbound you have to also define outbound it doesn't give you outbound automatically numbered between 0 to 
32,766, I believe. And then in order to do the routing, you should first define the deny rules and then the allow rules. Ephemeral ports are between these numbers, 32,768 to 65,535. Ephemeral ports are the ports used to send the responses. So in case there is a web request, and then the response is required. If you don't open the ephemeral ports, the responses will never go out. So that's why it is needed. NAT gateway uses uh, these ports, 1024 to 65,535. The other thing to note is that we have a NACL for our public subnet. Then we have a NACL defined for our web security group subnets. So private subnet will number 4.0 and 1.0, they both have same NACL. Similarly, we have NACL 3 for the data database. Please write some comments and let me know if you need to understand some details around this or you need to go much deeper on each of the component. And I will be happy to add a new video and give you some insight about each one of them. The next video in this series will be covering a lot more AWS individually, AWS services. And then you can go in their positives, negatives, when to use them, why to use them, what are the what are the cost aspect and other things, how they fit in architecture, where they fit in architecture. So the, we'll talk about those kind of questions. This is the end of the show. Thank you for watching. If you like the content, please like, subscribe, and press the bell icon for future updates. This is your host, Bhavesh Kumar, signing off. Thank you.